And that's great news. Thanks so much, Christy. Welcome back to In Session. We'll get back to the Florida versus Goodman trial in just a few minutes, but first we have an update and another big story that we're tracking today. We just learned that Jerry Sandusky, convicted child molester, has lost his pension after his conviction for child sex abuse. But there's another bigger story that's happening there is that his wife, Dottie, is blaming her adopted son, Matt, for Jerry's conviction. Matt did not testify at trial, but says that Jerry sexually molested him also. In a letter written to the judge and released uh, last night, Dottie accuses Matt of being a liar, being a thief. Uh, he's the man highlighted on your screen right there. She says Matt has bipolar disorder but refuses to take his medication. We have reached out to Matt's uh, lawyers for comment. Dottie also wrote that she has lost faith in police and in the legal system and is shocked that people were able to tell lies about her husband and get away with it. Um, meanwhile, the child molester's letter, uh, Jerry Sandusky himself, he blamed prosecutors, investigators, the accusers. The judge referenced the letters on Tuesday before he sentenced uh, Sandusky to 30 to 60 years in prison. I want to talk more about these letters, and I'll read them to you. Back with me, a couple of great criminal defense attorneys, Meg Strickler and Janet, ja uh, Janet Johnson. A lot of people probably do that, right, when they say your name real fast, yeah. Janet? <laughs> All right. Janet Jackson. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's do this. I, I want to read for you the first paragraph from this letter that uh, Sandusky, Jerry Sandusky, wrote to the judge before the judge sentenced him. I write without expectation uh, or a plea for leniency. However, I write with hope and resolve to keep fighting for a brighter day. This has been quite an experience. As I sat looking at walls, I spent many hours reliving this ordeal. First, I looked at me, my vulnerability, my nativity, some say stupidity, and my trust in people. Soon my thoughts turned to all the special people who have been hurt. My heart saddened and my eyes filled. He's so poetic here. Later, I began to relive uh, the events leading up to the trial and the trial. Having the time to do it was not the problem. It had been in preparation. There were so many people involved in the orchestration of this conviction. Media. Oh, yeah, we played a big role in that. Investigators, prosecutors, the system, Penn State, and the accusers. It was well done. They won. Uh, I wouldn't call it a victory. I would not call it a victory when you have this many uh, young boys whose lives were absolutely destroyed, but that's what he calls it. Uh, when I thought of how it ha transpired, I wondered how they had won. I thought of the methods, decisions, and allegations. I re relieved, he says, probably means relived, the inconsistent and dishonest testimony. My mind wondered again. What would be the outcome of all the honest testimonies? My mind wondered again. What would be the outcome of all the accusers and their families who were investigated? I knew the answer. All of their issues would surface. They would no longer be these poor, innocent people as portrayed. I have been blamed for all their failures and shortcomings, but nobody mentioned the impact of the people who spent much more time with them than I did. Nobody mentioned the impact of abandonment, neglect, abuse, insecurity, and conflicting messages that the biological parents may have had in this. That's right, it's their fault. Uh, those who have worked with troubled lives realize a common reaction for those with low self-esteem is often to blame others. Hmm, is that what you're doing here, Jerry Sandusky? They have been rewarded for forgetting, fabricating, and exaggerating. Maybe they will have a better place to live, a new car, access to more highs, but they won't change. Most of their rewards will be very temporary. Meg Strickler, this is what he is sending to the judge before the judge decides what sentence to give him? Really? No. What, what would be the purpose of this letter? It doesn't help. Normally, the judge all judges want to see acceptance of responsibility, some remorse, some sort of, I'm sorry, something like that. That would have really helped in the sentencing, some sort of acceptance here. Now, what he is and Dottie is are both poster childs for denial. All I see are these huge capital letters of denial, and every single word I see in that, everybody else is conspiring against him. I mean, really? This one really angers me because he's so in denial, he did not do those disgusting acts. Remember, he's quoted as saying that also. He has no idea. He really does, as the prosecutor is quoted as saying, he's not living in, he's living in alternate reality, which clearly is. Normally, these letters that our clients will write to judges need to kind of humanize the client, those kind of things. I use these letters a lot. I have my clients get letters of reference from many, many people, wives, family, whatever. Both these letters, as you can tell in the sentencing, did not help because there's no remorse, nothing. Uh, here's what I can't believe, and I, you know, and I understand that the client can do whatever the client wants to do, but 
I mean, if Amendola got this letter, he'd be like, uh, Jerry, this isn't going to help you, you know, why do you want to send it? I mean, you're better off saying nothing than saying what he's saying here, which is basically that there was a huge conspiracy against him, uh, that these victims were out there just to get cars and money and greed and the media's part of the conspiracy. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. This is outrageous. Why? I mean, I, I can't believe that his attorney actually allowed him to send this letter to the judge. Well, understand that it's the client who ultimately we are representing, and if they really wanted this letter to be submitted to the judge, we have to send it. I agree with you. I would most definitely advise my client, you really think that's going to work, that kind of thing. I would work with him, but understand ultimately if my client insists that they want that letter to go to the judge, what I do personally is I'll send a letter to my client saying, I strongly advise against this, this will hurt your case, so that myself is covered ethically, that I have done the proper counsel to my client saying, not a good idea. This letter does does not help you in any way, shape, or form. But ultimately, if the client wants to send the judge, as you see here, the judge gets to see and it. And what it does for me, it reveals Jerry Sandusky for who he is. Let me read the second paragraph of this letter. It's a little bit shorter. When I reflected, I realized much of what transpired was about protection. I was placed in protective custody. The system protected the system, the media, the prosecution, the civil attorneys, and the accusers. Everybody protected themselves. Penn State, with its own system, protected their public image, their decisions, and the allegations. The authorities were protected. Media protected their jobs and ambitions. I don't know what that means. I mean, that's directed at me. I don't know what that means. Um, prosecutors protected their jobs and egos. The system protected the prosecution. As the stakes became higher, people had more to protect. Civil attorneys were protected. He's now rambling. The accusers were protected and provided access to potential financial gain. Free attorneys, accolades, psychologists, and attention. Current and former police investigators protected their decisions and explanations to avoid criticism. The jury, this is the one, the jury put up a protective shield to avoid criticism from family, friends, and the public. So their verdict was not based upon the evidence, Janet. He's saying the, ev the, the, the verdict was because this jury was protecting themselves from criticism. My goodness, Janet, this is an outrageous letter to a judge before you are sentenced. It is, although he got 30 to 60 years, which, let's face it, that's actually a really good sentence when he was looking at 400 plus, and he didn't give them anything they could use in a retrial. And to me, that's the most important thing from the defense perspective. He didn't make any admissions, which is a lot better than what he did in the Bob Costas interview. I mean, this letter can't be used against him in another trial, which they're trying to get. So pending appeal, you know, at least he didn't admit to anything, and that's the most important thing in the next go around. Okay, we have a response from uh, Matt Sandusky's attorney, uh, and, and again, his mother uh, throwing him under the bus, and I'll read what she said. Actually, I'll read what she said first, and then I'll read uh, the reaction from uh, Matt Sandusky's attorney. And here's what Dottie wrote to the judge again. As far as our son Matt goes, remember, he didn't even testify at trial. Why is she talking to the judge about him? People need to know what kind of person he is. We have forgiven him many times for all he's done to our family, thinking that he was changing his life, but he would always go back to his stealing and lies. He has been diagnosed with bipolar. That's good. Out him on that. But he refuses to take his medicine. He's had many run-ins with the law and stolen money and items from our family. We still love him. Really? Then why are you writing this letter? Uh, and want the best for him, but because of his actions, we cannot express this to him. Here's the response from uh, Matt Sandusky's attorney. Matt is extremely disappointed that Dottie and the Sanduskys have decided to smear his character in an attempt to deflect attention from Jerry Sandusky's heinous crimes. Matt has shown tremendous courage and strength. Uh, rather than supporting her son uh, when he made the gut-wrenching decision to come forward and tell the truth about the abuse he suffered at the hands of Jerry Sandusky, Dottie Sandusky has chosen to continue Jerry's strategy of blaming and attacking the victims, thereby perpetuating the abuse. And that's from uh, uh, the attorneys for Matt Sandusky. So, Meg... Um, Dottie writing this. I mean, it's one thing, right? And I understand there, there's always more to a defendant than what happens in a trial, right? And I can understand the letter talking about what Jerry was as a husband. But just to write a letter to the judge, to throw your son under the bus who didn't even testify in the trial, what is that all about? My heart goes out to Matt Sandusky. I mean, he's a victim in this. And he, like, that, that, that statement from the 
attorney. It was really well written. He still is trying to stay above all this because, I mean, my gosh, what he has gone through, what all of these victims have gone through, that's what we need to admire. These people are still going on in life, not Jerry and Dottie with all their vitriol. I mean, that's a dreadful letter to say about your adoptive son. He is bipolar. He doesn't take his meds and he steals from us. That's dreadful. And it doesn't show a very good letter again to the judge because you're saying, I'm an angry person and I'm mad at my son. What she should have said is Jerry's, a, this is what I would have done, best, best case scenario, not much you can write about this guy, but I've been married to him, he's been a nice man, I, that's about all you could have written here. She can't write much more that doesn't sound, you just gotta say he was a good man of community, I mean, it's a dreadful situation, what does she write? But vitriol and anger is the worst thing to have said, and then to bring one of the victims in personally and say that, the judge, I'm sure, was thinking to himself, okay, what else can I read? Yeah, uh, Janet, it, I, I'm pretty shocked uh, right. by the fact well, because it, Jerry Sandusky is going to be in prison for the rest of his life. Uh, Dottie is on the outside. She is still a mother uh, to Matt. And, you know, there's ways to do it. If you feel that way, I, I just believe the better way is to, all right, you can't talk to Matt at this point, but figure out a way to reach out and let him know that you will welcome him back, not throw him under the bus. No, right, and she's picked a side and she's going with Jerry, but what they're addressing, I think, in both of their letters is he's now saying, I wanted to take the stand. This is now probably going to be turned against his lawyer as well because he's saying, I couldn't take the stand because they... I had the risk of opening the door to my son coming forward as a witness. Because remember, they were going to call Matt in rebuttal. He hadn't been listed as a witness because they didn't even know till halfway through the trial that he was actually molested and was going to, you know, possibly testify. So I think this is their way of saying, you know, and you didn't get to hear from Jerry, who would have told you how innocent he was. And the reason is because Matt was in the wings waiting to come on. So again, you know, it's obviously misguided. It's obviously, you know, horrible to write about your child. But what they're getting to is he's not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And on the appeal, maybe he'll testify and it'll all come out. All right, Janet Johnson from uh, Jacksonville, Florida today. I know we lost your picture, but we still had your voice. Glad uh, you're with us today. Meg, always a pleasure. Meg Strickler as Thank well. You. All right, folks, we're going to head back to Florida for more testimony in the John Goodman DUI manslaughter case. The prosecutor.